one to tweak recipes, making Drupal 8 render the markup that you want. Uh, you can follow along, the slide deck is already available, and if you have five minutes after the session, please, please uh, rate the talk, and especially what things can be improved. So I really look, I look forward to your feedback. <laughs> My name is Mauricio Dinarte. You can find me as Dinarcom pretty much anywhere in the internet. Um, I am from Nicaragua, beautiful country, really warm, and if you need a place to escape the cold weather here in Minnesota, you can go there. I work for a company called Agari, which is based in Boston, but we have people in different countries, myself in Nicaragua, other people in Mexico, Germany, and England. And if my objective for today is not to give you a list of all the things that you can do with Tweak, but instead to show you how to, how to work with it, how to understand the way that Tweak works so that you can do your own uh, templating according to your needs. So Leah Beruf, author of CSS Secrets, says, understanding the process of finding a solution is far more valuable than the solution itself. Many times we will be able to find an online you know, copy and paste, but if you don't understand where you're copying and pasting, then there is not a lot of value in that. So I will try to you know, make that clear. So this is an introductory session, so I'm going to start with the very, very basics. And in the end, uh, Twig is responsible for producing the markup of the website. And in the you know, outermost layer, it is the theme, the one responsible for, for producing the markup. So themes in a Drupal website control the appearance. And as such, uh, they define the layout of the website. For example, how it will behave when you see the website in a mobile device, a tablet, a desktop computer, or a 4K monitor. It also defines the color schemes, the fonts to be used, and in some occasions, themes can also provide some interactive user ex experiences. For example, uh, image slideshows, although that can also be accomplished by modules, some themes provide them. And along the presentation, there will be several links that you can follow along for more information. Now, uh, Templates, what are templates? They are used to separate the presentation logic from the business logic. And what that means basically is that uh, you have your backend when you do Oriole calculations, and then you pass some variables to the front end, and the front end is responsible for printing those variables. And it is the template that is going to receive the variables that went sent by the backend to print something. And the, te and the template is the one responsible for writing the HTML. Uh, and in some occasions, CSS, JavaScript, and assets, for example, images, to the page. Uh, we will see some example of templates, like this one. Uh, it is basically you know, a text file with some placeholders that will allow you to put dynamic content on the page. Uh, we're, not, uh, we're going to see more examples of templates later. This is the one used to, to print the breadcrumb of the website. The breadcrumb is like when you are deep uh, in the link hierarchy, like home, blog, and then the name of the blog, that you know, hierarchy line of links, that's the breadcrumb. And Drupal templates are like onions. And if you saw the movie, you will remember why. Because they come in layers. So in a, in a, to render one Drupal page, you will interact with a lot of templates. And for example, if you have a, a blog in your website and you have on the sidebar uh, an, uh, something that says more articles by the same author, then you are going to be interacting with at least five different templates depending on how you build that functionality. And it is super <coughs> important to understand what template is producing the markup at, e at every level. So if you need to modify something, you, you, you modify the proper template. If you modify the incorrect one, then nothing will happen. Um, and in the example that I just gave, uh, more articles by the same author, let's say that it is located in the sidebar, uh, right sidebar region, then in that region, we are placing the blog to print, it, to print the, the articles. That blog was created using a view. 
the view is printing notes and then from those notes we are printing some fields for example the title or the date it was created or the tax that it contains so one single piece of content in the website it's already five different uh, templates that you're going to interact with and imagine multiplying that by how many elements you have in the web in the page and you can easily end up with a hundred templates for one page and um, templates respect this hierarchy remember that they, you know they come in layers so the outermost layer for a template in Drupal is the one called HTML so all the templates ends with .html that tweak and the theme preceding that is the name of, of the template so in this case uh, where it says page like five lines from the bottom that means that this template is going to call the next one so the next one is going to be the page template this is the page template in here you see a lot of uh, places where it says page dot something for example page dot header page dot primary menu secondary menu breadcrumb content side by first side by second and so on in the page templates is where the theme regions are defined so each of those that page that something that's a theme region so for each of those lines another template is going to be called which is the region template and the region template is very simple it just verify if there is any content to print otherwise it doesn't print anything the region template calls content in in this in this scenario it is going to call the block template the block template also calls content which in this scenario is going to call the node template and you can continue on and on like this till you get to the field level and this is for you know one piece of the content of the website and you will see this behavior of templates calling other templates in the hierarchy many many times when you do uh, templating in Drupal is there a way of getting kind of a visualization of that in Drupal to be able to look at, you know, kind of look it up. So uh, what I, what I, because otherwise what you have to do to try to figure out, well, you know, which template is it, you've got to kind of yeah. search through this rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. So the question is if there is a way to visualize, visualize which template is which, so I can identify the one that I need to modify. Uh, in Drupal 7, there was a module called Devel Themer that would allow you to do that. In Drupal 8, that no longer exists, but we have other mechanisms and we're going to cover them like in a few minutes. But there are ways that you can pinpoint which is the template being used. So this is the one that I need to modify. So, uh, you know, as, as you can imagine by the title of the session, we're going to talk about Tweak. Tweak is a templating engine. Uh, it, for Drupal 8, it is written in PHP by the same uh, group of people who wrote the Symfony framework. Drupal 8 is built on top of the Symfony framework, and we are using Tweak, you know, as a templating engine. One, uh, Tweak replaces PHP template from Drupal 7 and, and, you know, and 6. And there are many, many reasons for doing this. One is for security. Uh, in, in Tweak, as Dru in Drupal 8 it is configured, everything is escaped out of, out of the box. Like, But more importantly, uh, in PHP template, you will be writing PHP. Therefore, you have everything that PHP offers in your theme layer. And by that, it means that you can drop your database and lose all your content if you, you know, do some mistakes in while writing the template, or what might be worse, if you get hacked and someone modifies the template, they can inject PHP code and either kill your website or use it to send a spam or, you know, to, to put something improper in the website and so on. So Tweak, it's a defend us from, from many mistakes that we can do maybe unconsciously. This is a Tweak template. Remember that Tweak exists beyond Drupal. You can use Tweak in, in many contexts, even when it is not a Drupal website. And basically, this is an HTML page with some placeholder, like uh, the placeholder will always start with a square, uh, with a square bracket? The curly bracket, thank you. 
It will always start with a curly bracket and then some other symbol. And we're going to see the syntax in a moment, but every time that you see a curly bracket, that means that this is, this is something dynamic that Twig will act on to modify on the page. So let's talk about a, a Twig syntax. When you see in Twig two curly brackets in a row, it means I want to print something on the website. Uh, in this case, in line number one, I am saying uh, it, this is a node template. So get the node and print the bundle. The bundle is the internal name for content type. So if you are viewing the article content type, that will print article. If you're viewing the basic page content type or a node of type basic page, it will print basic page. Uh, Twig is very flexible in the way that you can print stuff. Line from, from one to three, they are all equivalent. You can use the dot notation, which is the most popular, and we're going to see next why it is popular. Uh, but if, if you had to, you can also use a square bracket with quotations, uh, or you can use attribute, and then you pass you know, the variable, and then which property of that variable do you, you want to print. So from line one to three, it is all the same. In line number five, we see curly bracket hash sign. That is a common in Twig. That, that is going to be ignored. It is just like if you need to explain something in the template, you can use that. Uh, in line number six, we see an example from Drupal core uh, using the, the square bracket syntax. And it is actually really, really hard to find examples of those in core. Uh, core pretty much uses the dot notation 99% of the time. There might be between three to five examples of the square bracket notation, and it is used here because if the property that you want to print start with a hash, with a hash sign, you need to use the square bracket or the attribute. You cannot use the dot notation when the property start with a hash sign. That's why it is being used here. And I didn't find any um, any example in core of the use of the attribute. Uh, syntax, but that is one example. And what we're saying here is like inspect the full object and get the data dash full variable of that object and print that. And in here, you use this because if you have in the in the in the attribute a dash in the in 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 the name, Twig will think that you are doing a subtraction. So Twig will consider that uh, you know a math operation. So you need to use either the square bracket notation or the attribute notation. But for the most part, we're going to use the dot notation. And the reason is because it does a lot of things for us. Uh, the dot notation makes a lot of checks for you. For uh, it will check if you know the the key is is part of uh, an array. If not, if it is a property of an object. If not, if it is a method on, a, on an object. If not, if it is a get method or an if method. If not, if there is a render array, and if it is a render array, it will call the render function to print that, uh, to convert that in render array into HTML. And if none of the above, it's just like it doesn't exist, I return null. So everything, except for line 15 is Twig core. Like, no matter where you use Twig, that will be available. Line number 15, where it says return render, that is specific to Drupal. And that is the last check performed before returning null. Okay, uh, in Twig, you can also set variables inside the template. Uh, and this is often used to define classes that are going to be used in the template itself. In Drupal 7, it was a common practice to have to use preprocessed functions to create the, the, the classes that we were going to print later. In Twig, um, it is now recommended to define the variables in the template themselves. So the people who are working on the template, they have all the information that they need and all the context that they need in, in one single file. So in, to define a variable, you use the keyword set, then the name of the variable equals, and then the value. The value can be a scalar, which means like just like a string, like node, or it can be an array. In this case, it is an array. Uh, we are going to see 
uh, later what all these symbols means, like the tilde means concatenation, so, you know, to the left, concatenate the thing to the right. We can also apply some logic, like if a node is promoted, print this class. If a node is sticky, print this other class. Uh, and in this example, you can see in, in line number one and 10 that it is curly bracket percent sign. When you have curly bracket percent sign, Twig will not print whatever is inside. Twig will only print when you have curly bracket, curly bracket, like in line number 12. So in line number 12, we already prepared the classes that we're going to print. So we have a, an, a, an object called attributes, which has an add class method, and we pass the classes, and then it will, it will take care of printing the classes. Uh, I want to brief, uh, briefly stop here to, to comment that one of the benefits of using Twig is that it hides the complexity uh, for the themer. For example, there are a lot of people who are front-end developers. They are expert on their field, but they might not know PHP. Before, in Drupal 7, for example, they needed to know the underlying data structure. Is this variable an array? Is this variable an object? You know, they will have to know beforehand so they can use the proper notation. With Twig, we use the dot notation and it will take care of all the different scenarios. So it, it allows for people that maybe they know React, for example, and not PHP, to be able to produce uh, templates with Twig and also Twitch is inspired by other templating engines in other frameworks, for example, Jinja in, in Django. Uh, so people from that higher experiences in those other frameworks, they can pick up Twig very easily and be productive in less time than if they had to learn PHP in order to, you know, to write a template. So in addition to having the variables, Twig also has filters. And filters are, are used to modify some, some content. So for example, in line number one, I have a variable. That variable has some random string. And I apply the filter upper. To apply a filter, you use the pipe and then the name of the filter. In this case, the upper, upper filter will make the, the variable content uppercase. In line number two, I can apply the filter directly to some string. Uh, in line number four, uh, four, four to seven, uh, that's another way to apply filter. If you want to apply the same filter to multiple lines, you can put them like in curly bracket uh, percent sign, then the word filter, the name of the filter, and all the text that is going to be modified by that filter. Filters can also be chained, so the result of one is sent to the next one. So in line number 10, we have a variable name, which might have some HTML, and we want to strip that HTML, maybe for security reasons, so we apply the strip tax filter. And the result of that, we, uh, we apply the upper filter to make it uppercase. And in some occasions, filters can receive parameters. So line number 13 is actually from core, and it is a way to print all the modules that are enabled in the website you know, as a comma separated list. So I say modules, apply filter, save join, and I send what is the glue, what is the thing that is going to be put in between each element. And this session is not focused on security, but for you to know, uh, Twig Core has a filter called join. For many reasons, which are well documented in the Drupal documentation, uh, we should not use that. Whenever you need to join something in Drupal, you need to use the safe join filter. And you can see a list of Drupal specific uh, filters in that link over there. Uh, filters can or cannot receive parameters. For example, uh, if the number format filter will allow you to format some, some number, if you don't define the parameters, there will be some defaults available for you. But if you want to override a default, you just pass the list. So in this case, the first parameter is going to be how many decimal places. The second one will be uh, what, what is the decimal point separator. And the third one, what is the thousand uh, number separator. In, in Twig, we also have functions. Functions, um, 
they not necessarily return a value. They can do some operations. So uh, in, in line number two, we have random seven. That what does is it returns a random value between zero and seven inclusive. And in this case, because we have the two curly brackets in a row, we are printing that random number. Uh, in line five, five, five to seven, we are doing a for loop and we are using the range function. So it is going to produce a list of values from zero to seven inclusive. And in line number 10, that's a really interesting example. Uh, you see that we are using the curly bracket, curly bracket, and we are calling the attach library. Attach library function is a Drupal specific one used to inject uh, CSS and JavaScript on the page. But when you use that function, it's not going to be embedded inline. Instead, it is going to be added to the either header or footer of the website. So sometimes when working with functions, the result is not going to be inline. It's going to be somewhere on the page. It can modify the whole page. And the Drupal specific fun uh, functions are in, the, in that link. Uh, tweak also comes with test, like sometimes you want to check some condition. So for example, if the variable Q is not empty, <coughs> if the variable label display contains a value that is defined in this array, uh, you can do some and and or logic, like if this value equals this one and this other value exists. If this value is not empty and this other value is not empty, and in line number seven, we can see like if this number is odd or if this number is even and so on. Technically speaking, the only test in here is the word odd, but uh, is, not, in, or, and, those are used often in the context of test. And the test will always return a yes or no value. So as a summary, when do I use a filter, a function, or a test? Filters always require a preceding expression, like something before them that they are going to act upon. They can receive parameters and they will always return a scalar. That can be a string or a number. Functions on the other hand, they don't require anything behind them to work. They can receive arguments and the return value can be mixed. Like it can be a scalar, it can be an array, or it can be something that is modifying the whole page. And for tests, they also require an expression preceding it. They sometimes can receive arguments, and they always return a yes or no value. Boolean refers to a yes or no value. Uh, in Tweak, we also have control structures to define some logic. This is what Drupal uses to print the messages. Uh, like, for example, when you save a node, you see the node has been saved in a green box. That is the messages section, and that's, this is how Drupal prints that. So in this case, in line number one, messages is an array, and we're applying the length filter, which the length filter, what does is count how many elements are in the array. If there is more than one, print each element in a, in a list. Otherwise, do not print a list, just print the message itself. And in this case, because messages is an array, and there is only one, we want to get that only one element. So we apply the, uh, the first filter, and we get the content. Uh, it is important to note that the length filter wor works for both uh, arrays and for strings. Like, if you have an array of five elements, you will get five. If you have a string that is like hello, you are going to get four. And this is another example where tweaks abstract these inner, uh, inner structures from the themer. Uh, in PHP, like in Drupal 7, you will have to apply one function to get the numbers of elements in an array and a different function to get the number of characters in a string. In Tweak, that is uh, you know, a standard. That is one way to do both. And it will uh, return the reasonable value. Another example of control structure, again, this is how we print the breadcrumb. And in this case, uh, breadcrumb is, uh, is an array, and we say for each element in that array, I want to do something. And each element it, it in itself can be an object or an array. So we are checking in line number three, does this element contains a URL? If so, 
print an A, uh, A tag, which is going to be a link. Otherwise, just print the text itself. Okay, so that's the Twig basics, and we're going to go now to how do we overwrite the Drupal markup? We have said already that Drupal comes with a lot of templates. Uh, Drupal core ships with about five themes. One of them is called, called a stable, and a stable has 153 templates. So if there are so many, how do you know which one you need to modify? Uh, you know, why? <laughs> so let's, let's see an example of how to do this. Uh, when you have a vanilla installation of Drupal, you get this blue shade theme called Bartik. And when you create an article, you get a tagline that says submitted by someone on and then a day that includes the day and the time. We want to, let's say that we want to modify this to only say, you know, July 21, for example, 2016. How do we do this? <coughs> so this is the workflow that we're going to follow to override Drupal's markup. Uh, in Drupal core, there is a system called theme debug we are going, uh, we, I'm going to show how to do that. We're going to enable Thin Debug in, in Drupal. With Thin Debug, we are going to get information about the template. So it will allow us to locate a proper template to override. Once we identify the template, we copy that template to our theme. And then uh, if needed, we can use file name suggestions. We're going to see what that means in a moment. Then you make your changes, you clear the caches, then you rinse, rinse and repeat as needed if you want to modify many, many templates. And at the end, it is very important to disable thin debug. And I'm going to explain in some scenarios where if you leave this enabled, things won't work. So to enable thin debug, you can find more information in those links. But basically, there is a file in your Drupal installation under site's default called services.yml. And you modify these parameters to true, like debug, auto reload, and cache under tweak.config under parameters. And by that, and clearing the caches, you get theme debug enabled. When you have theme debug enabled, then you get uh, this. When you inspect the source code of the website, in addition to seeing the content, you will see some HTML comments, which in this case are shown in green. And they give three pieces of information. Uh, starting from the bottom to the top, it says begin output from, and it gives you a path and a file name. That is the template that you're using. So if you want to modify, uh, if you want to modify this markup, that is where you need to go to grab the template. Then it says uh, going up file name suggestions. So in, in Drupal. You can, for example, modify the template for different conditions, maybe for by content type. You want one template for the article content type and one template, let's say, for events in your website. So the node template is going to be responsible for printing every content type. But if you have a specific uh, variations based on content type, you can use a, a, a name suggestion, which is the word node dash dash and then the machine name of the content type like in this case article or basic page or vehicle or you know event and so on you can also define template suggestion for view modes so you can have for node slash uh, dash dash articles slash slash full view mode or dash dash teaser view mode and so on and it is even possible to define by node id but because node IDs changes from one environment to the next, it is highly recommended not to use them. So it is better to only use uh, by content type or by view mode. So when you do this, uh, and, and the third thing that you get is the theme hook being used. In this case, it says node. So this is how I identify what I am dealing with. It says, if this says node, I am dealing with a node. If it says user, I am dealing with a user. If it says views, it is a view. If it field, it is a, view, a field, and so on. And this is this can be used later in pre-process function to you know to provide more content to the to the template itself. 
there is a, a bug in Drupal core that for views, it doesn't read, it doesn't show all the naming suggestions. So if you are working with a view and you need to to know what are your, all your possibilities, visit that link and it will list all the template suggestions for views. Okay, we already identified which is the file that we need to copy over. It is node.html that tweak. Uh, in that file in line 26 and 27, we see that there are some some comments in the in the in the file and it says date the theme creation date of the field author name the theme author name of the field and in ni line 94 we say we see trans submitted by author on date so line 94 is what is printed the tagline of the node um how do okay now identify what i what i have i need to modify if uh when it says in the in, in, in line 26 and 27, theme, it means that it is HTML. In Drupal, it is a best practice to do not pass to the templates HTML markup. Instead, what you should do or what is recommended to do is pass render arrays. Because if you pass render arrays, then you can modify that in the template. If you pass HTML and you want to change that, you have to apply regular expressions and so many other complicated things in order to modify that. And unfortunately, here we are getting HTML, so we cannot use those two variables. We need to find some other way to get the, the creation time. And in the same file, line number 10, uh, it says, oops, sorry, node get created time. It will return the node creation timestamp. And that is a Unix timestamp. So I can use this variable in combination with a filter to, to show the date in the format that I want. And in this case, line number 94 and 95. So I am setting a custom variable, and then I get from the node, get the created, created time, and apply the date filter. And then I, pa I pass as an argument the formatting that I want to use. The, the capital F is going to print the month, a space, cap, lowercase d is going to print the day, comma, a space, capital Y is going to print the year like in four digits format. And then with that variable, I modify line number 95 to print that custom date instead of that date that is provided by core. And you might be asking, why do I need to set this variable? Usually it is not required to set variables for things like this, but the trans uh, filter, which is the one being used in 95, doesn't allow you to apply filters, functions, or tests within it. So if I were to put like no, no that created time is like date, it will not work. So this is something peculiar and unique for the trans filter. In any other scenario, you should be able to, to apply the, the logic directly where you need to use it. And uh, I assume that this file has already been copied over to my theme. Uh, it is, in this case, I am not using any naming suggestion. I am modifying all the nodes of all the different content types in my website. I reveal the caches, and then that is the result. So, um, for those who were paying very, very close attention, we remember that in the template itself, uh, the comment says node dot get created time uh, parenthesis, but I didn't use that. I used do, node dot created time, and this is like an overstress. You should not do this if you don't want to. But this is to ex exemplify the the how the dot notation works by using dot created time. The dot notation will look for a get method and will call that get method in the node object. So in like all those three lines that says set custom date, even though they are slightly different, they are all equivalent. So, you know, that's the power and the flexibility of the dot notation in Twig. And the example being said, a word of warning, this was for demonstration purposes only, do not do that. Uh, why? Because you are not supposed to to sub-theme Bartik or to copy templates from Bartik uh, because Bartik can change between one version to the next 
and let's say that for some reason uh, a class name is is modified the name is modified and in your css you depend on that class then you know things stop looking weird in the in the page so in in drupal core you are supposed to sub theme only the classic theme or the stable theme and uh, at the end of the slide deck there is a resource that you can watch a video to learn more about you know the basic of of sub theme and now I know that I have talked for a lot without mentioning the recipes themselves, so let's go into that. And before, one last thing. In the template, in the node template, we have many variables available. There is one variable called content and one variable called node. The content variable contains render arrays. When we go to our content type, to the manage display section of the content type, we can configure the fields using some, you know, formatters. How do we want to print this? The result of that configuration is going to be stored in the content variable as render arrays. In addition to that, you have the node variable, and the node variable is going to contain the field information and the raw fields. For example, you can have a Boolean field that it says this event is free or this event is not free. But internally, because it is a Boolean value, it is it is stored as a one or a zero. Uh, so depending on what you need to do, you have those two variables at your disposal. And in that link, uh, there is a blog post, really good one by Sasha Gossenbacher, Berdir, uh, that explained this a little bit more in depth. And there are also some examples of that. Okay, let's let's go to the recipes. How can I pass information from Drupal to Twig? That is, how do I pass information from the back end to the front end? So the recipe is modify the dot theme file. So in your theme, you will have a, a that's with the same name as your theme that dot theme, and that file will contain PHP. So in for this to pass variables, you will have to write some PHP. Then you implement a hook. Uh, notice that there, there is the word hook in lowercase and there is the word hook in uppercase. The word hook in lowercase is going to be replaced by the name of your theme. So if your theme is called Nicaragua, it, it, will, it will say Nicaragua preprocess and then something else. The hook in uppercase, you are going to put what you get from theme debug. Remember that theme debug says hook node, hook, user, hook, whatever. So that whatever is what, what you're going to hear. And this function is going to receive a, an array called variables as, an, as a reference. That means that whatever you modify in that variable array is going to be available later in the tweak template. You know, you modify the array, the array is going to be a key value pair, and the keys of the array we are going to become the variables in the template, and the value of the array is going to become the value of the variable in the template. And then when you have your variables ready, you just print them using uh, curly bracket, curly bracket. So let's see an example. Let's say that I have a, a node uh, of content type page, and my theme is called Nicaragua. And let's say that in this node, I am storing information about you know a, a big image and, a, and some text that goes along the image but remember that templates work like onions in layers let's say that I want to show the image and the text outside of the layer of the node like outside of the node context I want to show it somewhere else in the page so what I'm going to do is to make those two fields available out of node and available inside the page so what I'm doing in line number five, I am verifying. Is, is there, in this, uh, in this case, is there a variable called node? Every time that you are viewing a node, you will have that variable defined. And after that, you check, okay, uh, what is the bundle? Uh, internally, the bundle is the content type. So if, if, this, uh, if this node is of type page, I want to do this. Otherwise, I skip this logic that comes next. And the logic is I am creating two variables, one called cover underscore image 
and cover underscore title. And the value of those variables is going to be, I get a node, and from then I call the get method, which, and I pass the machine name of the field. So in this case, field image. And to the result of that, I call the view method, and I pass full. Full in this case is the, is the view mode. So you can pass full, you can pass teaser, or if you have a custom view mode, you know, you pass that. And what this is going to, to return at the end is an ar a, a render array representation of the image as configured in the full view mode. And I store that render array in the cover image variable. And the same logic applies for, apply for the cover title. Once I have those variables available, I go to my page template and I check uh, in line number one, if there is a cover image, then I print the markup. And note uh, line number one, and no, excuse me, note line number three and line number five. Both of them have cover title, but in line number three, I, I apply the render filter. In line number five, I do not. Why? Remember that uh, cover title is a render array. If I just check for if cover title, because it is a render array, it, it will evaluate to true all the time. Like, but the render array, when rendered, it can return an empty string, like there is nothing in there. So what I am doing there is call render on, on the variable to check if there is actual content on it. And if there is content, I print the content. And the reason why I, I am not required to do that in line number five is because when you print something with curly bracket, curly bracket, Drupal will call render for you. Remember that in the list of the things that the dot notation does is like before returning null, it calls render. So you don't have to do that manually when printing, but you have to do it manually when evaluating a condition. And the difference is one is curly bracket percent sign, one is curly bracket, curly bracket. So that's, that's how you do that. Let's go to the next recipe. How can I conditionally render fields based on the content of other fields. Uh, let's, let's assume that I have a Boolean field. Uh, in my node, I have some images, and I have a field that if, I, if it is a Boolean field, if it is true, the image is going to open in a light box. If it is false, the image is going to open in a new page. How do I control that? So uh, you have your, uh, your field, your Boolean field in this case is lightbox. You go to the manage display section and you hide the label where it says hidden. That is the label, you hide the label. And then in the output format, you select uh, one or zero. The Boolean fields have many different output formats. You have to select one or zero. After doing that, in the template itself, um, I am defining a lightbox to that, that is the condition itself, and I say content that field lightbox. Remember that content is going to contain render arrays. So I call the render uh, filter to get the result of that. And uh, the, I configured in the previous screen that to be either one or zero. In, in PHP, in Twig, and in many other applications, one is considered true, and zero is considered false. But in this case, we need to apply an extra filter, trim. And the reason is Drupal is so generous. It will give you more than you ask for. So when you print this, the one or the zero is going to come with a white space before it and a white space after it. And if you know a little bit of programming, if you have a string that is white space something, no matter what, it is going to evaluate to true all the time. Even though the text is white space zero space, space one space, because it, it is multiple characters, it is going to always evaluate to true. So by trimming the white space from the end and the beginning, we only get the zero or the one. And then the condition uh, can be applied. So if one, then print something. If zero, do not print something. And this, uh, can also be accomplished using the node variable, uh, but I, I make it like this to illustrate the example of uh, 
using render arrays and also to illustrate that you need to be very careful verifying what is returned by the render array. Drupal will most of the time give you more than you asked for and you need to modify that if you, if, if you intend to use it later. And in this case, I am sending a variable because I will use this condition multiple times in the same template. Uh, the screenshot is streamed here, but like if you only need to use it once, uh, because this is not a trans uh, filter, you can embed that directly in the if condition. Okay, how can I render an image field as a background image? So this change from Dup starting in Drupal 8.3, uh, but I am also going to explain how to do it in 8.2 and before. So uh, in Drupal 8.3, you configure your image field in the Manage Display section to use the formatter that says URL to image. And then you just render the variable. It was a little bit more complicated before. So this is the configuration. In the field is called horizontal image. I hide the label because otherwise when printed, it's, it, it, it is going to have more markup for the label itself. And select the format, and you optionally can select an image style to use. And then the image style is going to pre-process the image for you. And once you have that, uh, you, you do this, you know, uh, you, know you have some, some HTML tag, in this case, section, and then a style, background image, URL, and then a spaceless, the variable itself, and then in a spaceless. So if we zoom to line number two, we can see that we have the two curly brackets where we are printing content field horizontal image. That is going to be the URL as we define it in the previous screen. But why do we, know, why do we need a spaceless? Again, Drupal will give you more than you ask, and it will come with white spaces on each side. And uh, it is not valid CSS to have those white spaces in, as the URL attribute. So we remove th those white spaces. And uh, so that's, that's how, you, that's how you, you can use uh, an image in 8.3 onwards as a background image. In Drupal 8.2 and below, you actually need to install a separate module. The separate module is called URL for matter, but the rest of the recipe is going to be the same. When, once you have that module installed, uh, you also hide the label, and then the format, you say full URL, uh, you select the image style if you want to apply any, and you make sure that the image is linked to nothing. So you only get the bare URL. And then the same, you, you just apply that. And this is one of the cases where having theme debug enabled is going to mess up with your theming. Because remember that even though we are removing the white spaces, theme debug will still give you the HTML information like the, the hook, the name suggestions, and the template that is being used. So if you have it enabled, you remove the white space, but you will still get the every other thing. And again, that is invalid CSS, you know, attribute. So when doing this, you will have to like enable thin debug to get the information like which template and then disable to, to see it actually working. Um, how can I render node content? Oh, yes. Quick question on the image style that you're using. You were mentioning that you could choose one. Mm -hmm. um, do you typically use uh, the original image, or do you pre or uh, use an image style? So the question is, uh, if you need to define an image style, or if you can use the original image, that that will depend on your case. Like if you need to. You know, to show the original image, you can do so. There is, it is not a requirement to set an image style, but it is, you know, often the case that we have image style defining the website. So, if so, you are allowed to define one, but it is not a requirement. Yes. What about responsive? I mean, you're saying it's a certain size. Mm -hmm. Can I make a response? Can we just set up so then we're going to grab that one, or different sizes, or? So uh, the question is. For the background. Yeah. See, the question here is about responsive images. In this context, uh, we are working 
with a background image. And the way that this was set up, it doesn't take into account responsiveness. Uh, what we do is like through CSS, we, we make the, the image the full width of the, of the container. And there are modules that uh, allow you to, uh, to work with responsive images. Mark Drummond, which is local to the Twin Cities, he has sessions, recordings, and talks about this. So you, I invite you to check them out. But for this recipe, it doesn't take into account the responsiveness. Okay, thank you. So for the recording, uh, Amber shared that if you have a responsive image style, it will not work with this recipe because it will not print the URL only. It will also print either an image or a picture uh, tag with many things that it is not what the URL attribute of the background image is going to expect. So you will have to find some other way to do it. <coughs> okay, how do we render, uh, sorry, how do I render node content as HTML? So in this case, I have a file upload field, and it contains an SVG, and I want to print that SVG. Uh, so how do, and I, I, I want to use that SVG as an image tag. How do I do it? I hide the label, I select the formatter as URL to file, and then in my image tag itself, I define the source to be the content of the field. And again, I use the spaceless uh, filter to remove the white spaces from the beginning and from the end. Uh, let's say, let's have a different example now. Let's assume that uh, uh, using again the, the lightboard example, I, when I click on the image, I want to either show the, the light box or open a URL that the image links to. But that URL is going to be defined by an entity reference field inside that node. Maybe I have an entity reference that points to a node or that points to a user. And I want to use that pointer as the link that I'm going to visit after clicking. So how do I do that? For the entity reference field, you hide the label and you configure, uh, when you, you click the, the gear, and you say link the label to the reference entity. After that, you need to modify the template that renders that particular field. In this case, uh, you know, you use theme debug to find this information, field dash dash node dash dash, and then the name of the filter. And in this case, the final dash dash feature refers to the view mode. So I am being very specific in this case. And what I do is, for all the elements in here, I only want to rent, to print the URL. I don't want you to print the whole tag. I just want the URL. Give me only the URL. And as you can see, I am using the square bracket notation because the property start with a hash with a hashtag. And after I do that, then I can you know follow the same recipe from before. I have my H tag, and I use href content that feature cont field feature content and I apply the spaceless at the beginning and at the end. And by doing this, I am using the reference entity as my destination for the link. Okay, and the last recipe that I want to share, it is a little bit technical, and it is a shame that we have to do it this way, but you know, it's Drupal, we're not perfect. So let's say that I want to, from one note, I want to print a link, an absolute link to another node. How do I do that? So I need to use in Twig the URL function. The URL function expects two parameters. The, fir the first parameter is the route. That is like the routing system of Drupal. That's very low level. And in addition to that, you need to pass an array with arguments. And the argument is the word node as the key, and then the value. 
So let's say if you want an absolute link to node number five, you you, repl uh, you know you can put node colon five. But in this case, this is dynamic. And how, like we said before, that one of the benefit of tweaks is abstracting the complexity for the front end developer. Why does my front end developer needs to know how the routing system in Drupal works in the backend in order to print a link? Unfortunately, that's how it works as of now. And in this case, Drupal console is your very good friend. If you're familiar with Drush, Drupal console is uh, also a, a command line utility. And then you do Drupal, which is Drupal console, router debug, pipe, grep, this is in the command line, uh, pipe grep, and then where you want to link to. In this case, where we want to link to a node page. So we put a slash node. It will re return some values. Uh, among those values is going to be the view of the node, like the view page of the node, the edit page of the node, the delete page of the node, and so on. So you, from the results, you pick the one that you want. In this case, entity.node.canonical, and you run the same command, passing the route as a parameter, like Drupal, router debug, entity node canonical, and it will give you what it expects as a parameter, like the array, it will tell you this expects a, a, a variable node with the value x and y that is going to do something. So unfortunately, you have to do this. And all that I talked today is tweak core in Drupal. You know, in, you know tweak core plus the, the filters function and test that Drupal itself provides. But there are several contributed modules that extend this. So, you know, some of them provide more filters, more, more functions, more tests, uh, the, uh, debugging capabilities, and so on. So you can have a look at that list uh, for, for more things tweak related. If you want to learn more, I highly recommend you to, uh, to check out this presentation by Javier Aguiluz. Uh, he is the maintainer of the Symfony documentation. And remember, Tweak is part of Symfony, so you can expect this to be a very good session. And as I said before, Daryl Norris uh, gave a session last year at the camp called Drupal Nader Theme Station, Understanding Drupal 8's new theming layer. And in here, you can learn like more of the basic of, of theming. Like today, I covered the templating part, but uh, in this session, the theming is, is covered. And if you need support, you can go to IRC, you can go to Slack, or probably more effective, you can come to your week, your, your monthly meetup here in the Twin Cities and ask a friend. You have a lot of front-end developers, including Mark Drummond, in, in your town, so you, know, you can just ask him in person. And thank you very much for being here. Let's continue the conversation in Twitter. And please, please, please rate the session and tell me how can I improve it. Thank you very much. And if, if there are questions, otherwise, thank you. Do you have any slides online?